Hello, E2, and welcome to my talk about how to give a talk. It's very meta. Now, I have to admit that when I first got the topic of this talk that I was going to be doing, and I knew that it was going to be pre recorded, my first instinct was to create a very polished video with fancy editing and transitions and all sorts of things. But then I scrapped that whole idea because I realized that the whole point of this talk is to give you some ideas about how to deliver a powerful talk to a live audience. And yes, we will be going back to live audiences again. It's going to happen. It's going to be amazing. We're going to be at E2 next year, crawling over each other in the audience and licking lamp posts and stuff. It's going to be amazing. My name is Zia Hassan. I am a learning consultant out in Washington, DC. I don't know where you all are, but future me right now is in the chat. So if you do have questions or comments or something you want to discuss with me, I'm there watching this very recording with you and uh, probably noticing all sorts of weird pieces of dust on my clothing. Now, it's important that you know why I'm qualified to give this talk. When I was very, very young, I got a tape recorder. My father owned a Sony Walkman that had a record button, and I learned how to take a blank cassette tape and record my voice to it, which was the most thrilling experience in the world because now I got to be somebody like the radio DJs that I looked up to. I recorded myself doing full radio shows with music and everything, and it was just a fun thing for me. I was passionate about it. And then I was given the lead role in a school play. This was a school play in first grade called The Foolish Molar. I didn't even audition for this role. They just gave it to me. I don't know why. I still don't know why. In this play, I am a tooth along with other kids in my class that are also playing teeth. But I am the lead because I am the molar and I uh, foolishly had candy and got a cavity. So that was my first time being on stage. And the feeling of being in front of an audience and manipulating their emotions, influencing them, telling a story just really ingrained itself deep inside of me and I continued to do it throughout my life. In middle school, I joined a theater troupe and I started doing improv theater. That continued throughout high school. And then eventually I became a singer songwriter, uh, which I've been doing for the last, I don't know, 25 years here in DC. And what I do is I get on stage and I tell my stories and I play my songs and hopefully create an emotional connection to the audience before everything is said and done. And then of course I became a teacher and I taught third, fourth and fifth grade, which every single day when you're in front of a live audience and that live audience is children, you really get a knack for public speaking because you have to keep their attention. You have to keep them engaged. And then now my job is to be a tech trainer. I also teach a college course and with college students, especially in a night course, like the one that I teach, they fall asleep pretty quickly unless you keep them engaged. I've probably given speeches to tens of thousands of people. That's a lot of people to speak in front of. I don't get stage fright anymore. It's funny that if you were a live audience, I would be way more comfortable talking to you because I could see your face. I could breathe the same air as you. And we're going to do that really soon, I promise. But a lot of people ask me how I plan my talks, how I structure them, how I rehearse. And so this video is like the secrets behind all of the things that I do when I give a talk in public. So this is gonna be in no particular order. We're gonna take a question that I have been asked before. I keep a record of these and I'm gonna answer it for the first time in this speech on this video for you. Here's the first question. So here's what I say, go out of your mind. That's right, go out of your mind. And what that means is there is an internal narrator inside of your head. And you can actually make it say hello to you right now. Give it a shot. Make your internal narrator say hello to you. Make it scream really loud inside of your mind. You can control it and it talks to you at all times of the day. And if it talks to you while you're giving a speech, then you're very likely to be distracted by it. It's kind of like talking to someone while the radio is playing and you get distracted by what's on the radio. So here's what you do to remedy this. Develop a practice of mindfulness. 
I know you've heard this before, but it's a lot easier than you might think. All you have to do for a few minutes a day, three, four, five minutes, is sit down and listen to the narrator, but don't interact with it. Anytime the narrator talks, let it talk. And after a while, if you just let it talk, it ends up getting quiet. Now you have to do this. It's like building a muscle. It's like going to the gym. You have to do this on a regular basis. Otherwise you won't feel the effect of it when you go in front of a live audience. So make sure that you're practicing every day going outside of your mind. Should you slow down? That's a very common piece of advice to slow down. I don't like this advice because here's what it sounds like when I slow myself down. Hello, welcome to my talk about TPS reports. That can become boring really fast. So here's what you are going to do instead. You are going to talk like you normally talk at the pace that you normally talk, except you are going to enunciate every single word that you say. If you enunciate every single word that you say and say it really crisp and clear, it's really hard to speak fast like that unless you're one of those people that can talk really, really, really fast and still enunciate. And that's not many of us. If that's you, you are probably already very good at public speaking and you don't need my help. So don't think about slowing down. Instead, your cue is to enunciate every single word while speaking at your regular pace. The first thing you want to do is forget the idea of practicing in front of a mirror. You are not going to give a speech to a mirror. You are not going to give a speech to yourself. So it's important instead to first start by giving a speech to an empty room. And you are going to use your phone to record yourself giving that speech so that you can watch it afterwards. And yes, it's going to be painful if you aren't used to this to watch yourself give a speech. It is painful, but you're going to do it because it's going to help you find ways to make your speech better. It's going to show you where you are acting in particular ways that might be distracting or boring or too over the top, and you can really contain it uh, by watching this recording. It's kind of like how sports teams watch recordings of their game so they can do their game better the next time. I don't really know much about sports, but I think that's a pretty good strategy. And then if you can, you need to get a test audience for your speech. You need to get a small audience of people in front of you that can give you feedback. So give your speech to a small audience of people and ask them these two questions. You can ask them more than this, but these are the two you need to ask them. Where were you most engaged and where did I lose you? Where did your attention drift? If your audience can tell you when their attention waxed and waned, you have a really good idea of what parts of your speech were effective and which parts of your talk, which parts of your speech were not. Another thing people like to do is do a quick version of their speech once they get it down, just to go through the different parts of it. You don't have to give it in full. You just kind of hit the notes and that kind of cements in your brain the structure of the speech so that you can fill it with all the different words that you're going to put into the speech when you actually give it. Now, here's the thing. We talked about the speed. We talked about enunciating your speech. The really important thing to remember, and this is this will throw you off if you ever go on a stage after rehearsing, you rehearse at a good pace, you get on stage and then on stage, because you're in front of a live audience, adrenaline is pumping through your body and immediately you start to speed up. When there are those issues where someone is talking too fast, it is usually not because they're just a fast talker. It's usually because there is adrenaline pumping through them because it's a very nerve wracking event if you've never done it before or if you don't do it that often. And so your speech speeds up. So you might want to, right before you go on stage, look at some kind of reminder to slow down. This is not to say you should rehearse in a way that's really, really slow, but it's just to remind yourself and to sort of bring yourself back to rehearsal pace when you're in front of a live audience. It just requires a little bit of a reminder, a little bit of a mental shift. Okay, let's talk about your slides. 
I don't know how to tell you this without being direct, so I'm just going to be direct. Your slides have too many words on them. Your slides have too many words on them. If they have more than like five words, seven words, there are too many words. Here is the deal. Your job as a presenter is to transfer emotion. You are doing an emotional transfer. This emotion that I am feeling right now should be making an imprint on you wherever it is you are. So if you put words on a slide, even if you're not reading those words off of the slide, your audience is reading those words on the slide, or at least they're trying to, but at the same time, you are giving a presentation and trying to transfer emotion, and putting words on a slide like that causes friction in that process. Get rid of the words and focus on your delivery. If you use visuals, and it's a great idea to use visuals, I really recommend using stock photos. Use stock photos to make your points. Maybe throw in three to five words if you feel like it's necessary, but see if you can make your slides completely free of paragraphs, sentences, make them as concise as possible. Make them add to and enhance your emotional transfer. That is the goal of a presentation, a good presentation. If you read The Art of Public Speaking, a book by Dale Carnegie, famous for writing the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. One of the tips that he gives is to vary your pitch and the speed at which you talk. And you might have been noticing that that's something I've been doing in this talk, but I don't think about it consciously because when people hear this tip, they think to themselves, okay, I need to go on stage and I need to fluctuate my voice and I need to speed up sometimes and slow down other times. That can work, but it's a little bit artificial. Here's what you're gonna do instead. Instead, you are going to get curious and passionate about your topic. You can tell that I love public speaking. You can tell that this is something that fires me up. And just because it's special to me, my voice will naturally follow that passion. And when your voice naturally follows your passion, it will vary in pitch and it will vary in speed and it will do so naturally in a way that connects emotionally to your audience and doesn't sound forced. So if you aren't already fascinated by your topic, if you aren't already interested in your topic, I recommend finding some way to do that. I don't really know what that might mean for you. It might mean some more research or maybe something like that, but you need to make sure that you get on top of it. This is something that you can really play with uh, and you don't want to overdo it because if you're constantly moving your hands around, then that is going to be a distraction. So think about it like this. You have gross motors, those big muscles in your body, like your arms, your legs. You also have fine motors, like your fingers, like your toes. And what I like to do, and this is just me, so you can take this for what it's worth. I like to be a little bit reserved with my gross motors and I like to be a little bit more flexible with my fine motors. So you'll see me doing a lot of things with my hands, with my fingers. And I kind of, I don't think about it. I just kind of let my hands do a little bit of talking as I'm going. Uh, but I, you want to make sure when you watch your video back of your presentation that the hands aren't really distracting the audience. And that's something you can ask your, ask your test audience when you do a test audience run. That's really important because it frames the entire way that the audience sees the topic. There's an amazing YouTuber named Michael Stevens. He goes by the name of Vsauce on YouTube. Check out his channel, it is phenomenal. But what's really interesting about his videos, other than the content of the videos, are the titles of the videos. There's a video he has called, How High Can We Build? Now that's fascinating. That's a really fascinating question to think about how high can we build a building and uh, without it falling down? How does gravity pull from both uh, the earth and from space at the same time? And where does where is the breaking point? The video itself is about gravity. But can you imagine the difference between saying here's a video about gravity versus how high can we build? There's a difference and the title really makes a difference. For instance, if I were to make a video about nutrition for toddlers, 
If I call it nutrition for toddlers one-on-one, -on -one, that is a snooze fest. And I could give a great presentation, the exact same presentation, and call it something like how to stop your toddler from throwing food on the floor. And I guarantee more people will be interested in the topic. Even if the content is exactly the same, the way that I framed it, the entry point makes a huge difference. I got this tip from a high school teacher, one of my high school teachers when I was in high school, which was when you are changing to a different subtopic in your speech, you should move across the stage. You should walk to your new topic. Don't do this. It looks awkward. Instead, provide movement through story. Now, story can be used very effectively to make your points and make sure that your story has a beginning, a middle and an end and make sure that those beginning, middle and end points are clear. If you have a beginning, middle and end of a narrative arc, your audience will feel the movement of the story. And yes, you can physically move as well when it feels necessary to do so, but you don't have to force yourself to walk to a new point every time you have a new subtopic. I will tell you that the most influential, inspiring speech that I ever heard was 20 seconds long. We'll come back to that in a minute. There are triggers that you can use. There's a great book by Sally Hogshead called Fascinate that actually talks about these different triggers. But my favorite trigger from this book that you can use to get someone's attention, to make them fascinated in the topic that you're talking about, is you can create curiosity. I just did that for you when I told you about an influential speech that I heard, the, the most influential speech that changed my life that was 20 seconds long. When I said that, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what was that speech? Come back to that, tell me. And it makes you fascinated and it makes you keep listening to the end of this little piece here. But one thing you can try, many people when they are about to give a speech on a stage, they hide in the green room and they're nervous and they're waiting. And when they finally come out, uh, they haven't spoken to anyone in like 20 minutes. Now you don't wanna ruin your voice during that time, but I recommend talking to other people. It could be the other presenters that you're working with at a conference. It could be people in the audience that you're meeting and greeting as you go. And when you're having these conversations, you can strategically have this sort of back and forth with them, this rapport that you're already starting to build. And you can kind of practice coming up with interesting things to say. You can play off of the things that they say. You can make a joke. You can try things out. It's a low stakes environment to get you warmed up for the actual speech. Some people do, I don't know, vocal gymnastics, little acrobatics, mommy made me mash my M&Ms, that sort of thing. And that's probably a good way to warm up your voice and your tongue, but interacting with people is an even better way to warm up for a speech. I recommend you do that. This requires practice. Here is my best suggestion for how to be more articulate. You shower every day, don't you? I'm sure some of you do. In the shower, if you're about to give a speech, start to talk as if you are presenting. And you can talk about your topic. You can go back and revise. This is actually how I came up with a lot of the content for this speech. I did it all in the shower. Um, by the way, you can buy waterproof shower pads that repel water and you use a pencil and you can write down your ideas when you're in the shower as well. It's a great way to make sure that good ideas don't go down the drain. All right, people get worried about filler words, things like ums and ahs and, you know, those words that kind of just fill up the space in between actual thoughts. Here's the trick, and you kind of have to train yourself to do this. Every time you feel yourself getting to a filler word, replace it with silence. It feels weird to replace an um or an ah with silence, but in your mind, it feels like that silent bit is longer than it does for the audience. 
remember that the audience is also processing the information that they're receiving as you are saying it. So when you pause, not only do you get rid of those filler words, but you also allow the audience to digest what you are saying. So I recommend, if you can, to go to your speaking environment early and get a feel for it. Breathe the air, stand on the stage, stomp your feet, yell into the crowd. With no one there, you can really play around with the environment and you can get a feel for it. And by the time you actually deliver your speech, you're gonna be a lot more comfortable with that space. Now, what happens if you get to your stage and it is not what you expected? I once played on a stage where there was a loud air conditioner next to me for my entire set. It kept turning on and it kept turning off. And in the times where it was off, you could hear me playing. In the times where it was on, it was definitely loud and kind of overpowering my performance, even though I was playing through a speaker. So I played with that idea. So this is what I did. At one point, the owner of this little room turned the air conditioner off. And you know how when you turn off an air conditioner, it takes a few minutes before it actually shuts down, like there's a good lag time between flipping the switch and the air conditioner actually turning off? So I turned to the air conditioner and I made a magical gesture at it right at the moment I thought it might turn off. And I was right. And the air conditioner shut down right as I made this magical gesture at it. And everybody stood up and applauded for me. That was the most applause I got that night. And it was because I learned how to play with my environment. I was open to the fact that this was kind of annoying and this was kind of getting in the way of my performance. And I just made it work for me. I just came up with an idea and played with it. That takes a little bit of experience, but look for those things. When you have a situation, something goes wrong, you can always play with it. I was giving a speech once at a local university here in DC, and I walked out to a crowd of people, and I said, good morning, and I said the name of the institution, and I said the wrong name of the institution. I, I, I said good morning to the wrong college. And when they informed me that I had said the wrong name, I was extremely embarrassed. So <laughs> I left the room in a very dramatic fashion. I didn't really know how to recover from that just by standing there on stage. So I ran out of the room in a very dramatic fashion. Everybody laughed. I came back in as if nothing had happened. And I started all over again as if nothing had happened. And they thought it was really funny. And later I was told it was a really good save. <laughs> and compare that to what some people might do and say, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. I can't believe I just did that. Please forgive me. At that point, the speech is already off the rails. If you start from that place of that energy, then that affects the rest of your presentation. So make sure if you make some huge mistake like I did, that you do something kind of dramatic to recover from it and bring back that energy. It will look different for you and your personality and the people you're presenting to, but that's what I did in this particular instance. Okay, one last thing, and I know it, that the background looks a little bit different right now because it's the next morning, I wore the same shirt and even put my ring back on so that it didn't look like there were any continuity errors. I had mentioned earlier in the talk that there was a speech that was given that was really persuasive and influential for me. It changed my life, and it was only 20 seconds long. I work at Anne Arundel Community College, which is a college in Maryland. I teach a human growth and development course there, and every year there's a meeting for the adjunct professors to come and share ideas and just get on the same page with each other. It's once a year, but at the very first one that I did, there was a person there from the Anne Arundel Community College coaching program. And that is a program that trains new coaches to go out into the world and help people with their dilemmas. I will be honest with you, I don't even remember the words that were said in this presentation from the person giving it. I don't remember I remember that she had about 20 seconds to kind of advertise for this program. But after that 20 seconds was over, I was completely sold. And I knew that doing this program would change my life. And I have now done the program and it has changed my life. And the reason why I bring this up is because that speech that she gave 
had no stories in it. It had no narrative arc. It was actually very fast. She spoke very fast. A lot of the ideas that I've given you in this video, she didn't really follow those necessarily. But the subject matter was like lock and key for my brain. And this is maybe the most important lesson of all. If you can figure out what the key is to the lock of your audience's minds, what is going to unlock some kind of passion in them? And if you can communicate that with passion, then you might change someone's life with your public speaking. You might change a child's life if you work in the classroom. You might change a conference member's life if you're speaking at a conference. And when I told her later on that this had occurred during those 20 seconds, she was almost surprised. And that's another thing to remember. We often don't know just how much impact our words have. So if you are ever feeling like what I have to say and what I have to say in this speech isn't that important or I'm going to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about, just remember that there is very likely somebody out there that hears your words, takes your words, and something about their lives will change as a result of your words. So I encourage you to go out there, talk to people, share your story, share your ideas, and as you're using all these different techniques, go ahead and tweet at me, send me messages on Instagram, wherever you can find me online, and then check out my podcast, which is called Gently Down the Stream, where I talk just like this every single week about topics that have to do with changing your life. So that's it, E2. I care about you very much, and I know you're going to go out there and change people's lives with your public speaking, and I cannot wait to be there to cheer you on. Mm -hmm.